GPUs are data plane processors, so it should be no surprise that the data payload of content is critically important to the performance that can be achieved. In this section, we will introduce some best practices to help you create efficient content that will perform well on a wide range of mobile devices. Geometry is one of the areas that is one of the architectural weaknesses of a tile-based renderer like Molly, as we sacrifice some geometry bandwidth efficiency for benefits of being able to keep the fragment shading working set inside the GPU local tile memory. It is therefore of critical importance to make geometry as efficient as possible. The easiest control to use is simplifying meshes to use fewer triangles. This will give a proportional reduction in vertex memory bandwidth and shading cost, and, in most cases, also helps fragment shading efficiency. This fragment efficiency comes from a reduction in the number of partial quads that are created. Fragment shading is processed by a stream of 2x2 two two fragment quads, and any fragments in a quad that are outside the edge of a triangle are wasted. This makes small triangles disproportionately expensive, so make your triangles in your meshes as large as possible. Once triangle count is under control, the next task is optimizing the vertex connectivity to minimize the number of vertices. Use index draws to maximize the reuse of vertices across triangles, and ensure that your index buffers have good spatial and temporal locality to minimize any reshading. A well-encoded mesh with good reuse can often share a single vertex across five or six triangles, so the average number of vertices per triangle should be well under one for most meshes. The final task for the initial encoding review is to check the data format and precision of the input and output vertex attributes. We see a lot of content using 32-bit floats for all input attributes, but this is rarely needed and can rapidly consume bandwidth. In the table shown here, you can see that the size of a vertex can be almost halved by using narrower types such as float 16. This table shows a common efficiency mistake when passing in vectors for lighting calculations. Here, we can see that the user has passed in three unit length vectors, the normal, binormal, and tangent. These three define the axes in the coordinate frame, and are always at 90 degrees from each other. It is not necessary to pass in all three. With knowledge of any pair of the three, it is possible to recompute the other. This allows us to omit one of the attributes completely. We'll just reconstruct in the shader code, which is nearly always more energy efficient. It's not shown in the table, but we could do a similar trick with each of the individual vectors. Given we know that they are unit length, we could just store the X and Y components and reconstruct the Z component in shader code. This would reduce the vertex size by a further 15%. We have already talked about the importance of application calling as a means to reduce draw call counts. The same techniques are also useful for reducing the vertex count processed by the GPU. The most important thing to remember is that GPUs have no knowledge of your scene. So, if you pass a million out-of-camera vertices, they are all going to be processed so the GPU can determine their position before they can be called. This can add up to a huge amount of redundant processing. Exploit the high-level knowledge of the scene that the application has to call as much as possible in software. This can include frustrum testing, for calling things outside the camera view, as well as techniques such as portal calling, for calling things that are inside the frustrum, but occluded by floors, walls, or ceilings. The final advice in this section is to avoid tessellation shaders and geometry shaders. Both are techniques designed for immediate mode GPU architectures, where the expanded geometry complexity stays inside the GPU and never hits main memory. For a tile-based GPU, where at least some of the expanded complexity is written back into main memory prior to fragment shading, both techniques are a poor fit. For content with relatively unconstrained camera and object positions, each object should be provided with multiple meshes at different levels of detail, or LOD. The game engine should select simpler meshes as objects move further away from the camera. You don't need thousands of triangles for a model that is only 10 pixels high. The main goal here should be to use an LOD that preserves the silhouette edge of a model. Other geometric detail can be infilled using textures and lighting. When creating mesh LODs, avoid creating the low detail meshes by sparsely sampling from the level 0 LOD. Molly GPUs shade vertices in sets of four contiguous indices. So, sparsely sampling every fourth vertex to create an LOD will end up shading the whole mesh, and losing any advantage. Instead, create LODs by tightly packing the vertices you need. This makes the buffers larger in memory, but the actual bandwidth per frame will be lower as only the used LODs are touched. One common mistake that beginners make is trying to model fine detail in-game using geometry, 
This is very expensive, requiring very dense triangle meshes, and can also suffer from aliasing artifacts due to the high density of triangle edges. To model complex surfaces and their interactions with light, it is recommended to use just enough triangles to preserve the silhouette edge of an object. And, to use texture-based techniques, such as normal maps, to add detail to the surfaces of the object. These pseudo-geometry techniques, when combined with mesh level of detail, can significantly reduce the complexity of meshes, and in many cases, actually improve the visuals because textures behave better when being downscaled than very dense meshes. In the first module of this series, we introduced the concept of geometry processing pipelines that reorder the operations performed to minimize the amount of redundant processing. All MOLLE GPUs since the Bifrost architecture family implement an optimized index-driven vertex shading pipeline. This computes the position for each reference vertex, then runs the primitive assembly and culling stage, and finally runs the remainder of the vertex shader to compute the other non-position vertex shader outputs. Even in well-performing applications, around half of all vertices are cold because they contribute only to back-facing triangles. It is therefore critical that the position shading stage only touches data that needs to compute position, and doesn't pull in unrelated data that will never be used. To get the best performance and energy efficiency out of the scheme, the application input buffers therefore need to be packed appropriately. Here, we see the optimized vertex from before. The input attributes contain just a single field, which is needed by the position shader. The other four are only used to compute non-position outputs that feed the fragment shader. One common memory layout is an array of structures, storing each vertex as a set of interleaved fields in memory. In this example, each vertex is 32 bytes in size, and the GPU line fetch from DDR is 64 bytes. A single DDR fetch will therefore pull in two entire vertices. The downside of this scheme is that the position-related data is interleaved with non-position data. Fetching the position during the position shading stage will also fetch all of the non-position data, because it is in the same cache line, and half the time the non-position data is never used. For this model, approximately 30% of the data fetch is redundant. A better solution is to store the vertex as two separate array of structures arrays. The first contains interleaved data needed for position calculation. The second contains interleaved data needed for the remainder of the vertex shader. Now, the position shader will only fetch useful position-related data, and the application will get the full bandwidth savings advantage of the IDVS scheme. Most user interfaces are relatively simple in the terms of geometry complexity, but there are some areas where developers need to be careful. Here, we can see a typical way to render a rectangle, using two triangles to form the shape. This is functional, but has a 1% overhead in fragment shading due to the use of 2x2 two two pixel quads during fragment shading. The 2x2 two two quads in orange will be shaded twice, once for the bottom left triangle and once for the top right triangle, because the quad has partial coverage of both triangles. A better approach for rendering large rectangles is to draw a triangle that is double the desired width and height, and then use a scissor box or viewport so that only the desired region is rendered. This gives the same screen coverage, but without a diagonal seam. In reality, it's unlikely that one diagonal seam through a quad is going to cause problems. It's only a small overhead compared to the rest of the quad, and hopefully, the UI isn't using very expensive shader programs. However, we do see content using dense triangle meshes to render radius corners and other curved shapes. The most obvious way to implement curves is a fan of triangles from a central pivot point, but this causes multiple long thin diagonals, with each edge incurring additional overhead due to partially covered fragment quads. This can quickly add up to significant overall overhead if the area covered is large. A better solution to radius corners is a recursive subdivision of the shape. This still requires two diagonals per corner, but thereafter, the subdivision is handled using smaller and smaller triangles with diminishing edge lengths. This approach maximizes the area to edge ratio and minimizes the number of partial quads required. Note that the vertex count in this case is identical to the bad case. The only difference is the vertex ordering in the primitive assembly. For textures, there are really two major recommendations. Ensure you're using texture compression for all offline textures, and that you're using mitmaps for textures used on 3D objects. Both of these techniques can significantly reduce memory footprint and run to memory bandwidth. We do still see content shipping using techniques designed for older OpenGL ES2 hardware. Older hardware often only supported ETC1 texture format, which is an RGB format 
and required users to emulate support for RGBA by making two separate texture lookups into a double width texture. One sample fetches the RGB values, and one fetches the alpha value. This is far more expensive to process than a single sample into a format which supports four components, such as ASTC or ETC2 plus EAC. So, is best avoided on current hardware where better alternatives are available? In terms of compressed texture usage, we'd recommend that new titles consider using the ASTC format by default, with fallback to ETC2 if ASTC is not available. ASTC has been shipping in devices since 2012 and is mandatory in OpenGL ES 3.2. So support for the 2D LDR profile is now ubiquitous in mobile devices, and many devices support the 2D HDR profile too. ASTC has two major advantages over ETC2 plus EAC. Firstly, it is a much higher fidelity compression format, achieving significantly better image quality at the same bitrate. Secondly, it provides a wide choice of bit rates, allowing users to really fine tune their texture footprint and bandwidth consumption. The recommended starting bit rate depends on the resource being compressed. For 3D object, albedo, and diffuse textures, we'd recommend starting with 6x6 blocks, which store at 3.56 bits per pixel. This is 10% smaller than ECC2, but still generally gives better image quality. Generally, Textures used for 2D UI overlays and 3D normal maps need higher quality than 3D object albedo textures, so we're recommending increasing the bitrate to 5.12 bits per pixel using 5x5 blocks. Conversely, pre-baked light maps are often low frequency textures, and so can get away with lower bit rates, such as 2 bits per pixel using 8x8 blocks. To make the best use of the texture cache in the shader core, we are recommending using the decode mode extensions where available, to reduce the decompression precision of your textures to 32 bits per pixel. By default, it's 64 bit, unless using the sRGB profile, which is always 32. The runtime cost of a texture sample is dominated by the algorithmic cost of the texture filtering mode that is used. Even assuming perfect caching, changing the texture filter can result in samples that take many times more cycles to process, and many times the memory bandwidth. The baseline texture filter that is really using content is a bilinear filter, the geolinear MIP nearest filter in OpenGL ES. Each sample reads four texels from a single MIPMAP level, in a 2x2 pattern, and blends them based on distance to the sample point. This is the fastest filter supported by the Mali GPU, giving full speed throughput and the lowest texture bandwidth. The next level of filter used is a trilinear filter, or the geolinear MIP linear filter in OpenGL ES. Each sample makes two bilinear samples from the two nearest mipmap levels and then blends those together. This runs at half the speed of a basic bilinear filter, and may require up to five times the bandwidth for some samples as they fetch data from a more detailed mipmap. The latest hardware supports anisotropic filtering, an advanced filter which can make multiple bilinear or trilinear sample taps to create a piecewise approximation of a pixel's texture coverage. This is a fantastic filter for preserving detail, even at glancing viewing angles, but it can be very expensive. For a trilinear filter with 4x max anisotropy, a single sample may require 8 cycles of filtering, and up to 64 times the bandwidth as some samples shift from MIP level 3 to MIP level 0. A nice looking filter, but used with care. This image shows the cost ranking of various filter types. The most important thing to note is that, used carefully, anisotropic filtering can be used with manual performance overhead. Using anisotropic filtering with bilinear filter taps and 2x max anisotropy has a maximum cost of two bilinear samples, but in many cases, will only need one. Therefore, on average, it is less expensive than a traditional trilinear filter, which will always need two component samples. This is worth trying over trilinear, as it can give both image quality and performance improvements. The other thing to remember is that the max anisotropy value doesn't need to be a power of two. If two doesn't give enough quality, Test if 3 is good enough before trying 4. Video decoders typically generate textures in a YUV format in memory, as a more bandwidth efficient alternative to RGB. To avoid the need for conversion to an RGB surface in memory, the Mali GPU shader core can direct read a YUV surface and convert it into RGB data. Use the OES EGL image external extensions, accessible in Android via the Surface Texture class, to directly import the YUV surfaces into the graphics context, and allow the GPU to sample from them using an external sampler in your shader code. 
This will transparently handle the YUV format plane layout and color space conversion, and RGB values will be returned directly to the user shader code. 2D rendering is ubiquitous in mobile devices, commonly found in user interfaces, 2D games, and particle systems inside 3D games. One common performance problem we see with 2D content is blended overdraw, where a single frame consists of many layers of fragments covering every pixel. If these layers are not opaque, they must all be shaded and then blended with earlier layers. This can quickly overload the GPU and mass market devices, in part due to the high screen resolutions found on mobile, even if the layers are individually simple. This example shows a typical side-scroller parallax background, with eight layers that can be scrolled at different speeds to give an illusion of depth. These layers use alpha transparency to have smooth transitions between layers, so a basic implementation needs to render the layers from back to front to ensure blending works as expected. If we tint the transparent pixels pink to show the alpha transparency, we can see that drawing whole layers would be horribly wasteful. We can avoid the worst of the overdraw by using a small number of vertices to isolate the useful part of each parallax layer, discarding the completely transparent parts. We do this using a minimal number of vertices, as adding vertices is expensive, and the cutout doesn't need to be perfect. If we look at how these cutout layers for our parallax game stack, we can see that there is still a significant amount of overdraw around the horizon line in the middle of the screen, and around the terrain. For this example, we have a peak of 6x overdraw, and an average of around 4x. Given that most of the sprite layers are opaque, this is still a lot more expensive than it needs to be. We can do better. Let's go back and look at one of our layers in the background. We are getting the overdraw problem because we need to draw with blending turned on to get the smooth edges around the border of each building, and some aspects which have transparent windows. But in reality, the majority of this layer is opaque with an alpha value of 1. To benefit from the hardware functionality the GPU provides to remove overdraw, either early ZS testing or hidden surface removal, we need the opaque regions to be an opaque draw with blending disabled. We can therefore split our mesh into two parts. The first part creates a simple cutout of the opaque regions in the layer. Again, this doesn't need to be perfect, and we just want to add a minimal number of vertices to achieve this. In this case, we implement the cutout using 70 vertices. This element of the layer can be drawn with blending disabled as we know there are no transparent fragments remaining. The remainder of the layer, containing holes where the opaque parts have been cut away, is our transparent draw, that needs to be drawn with blending enabled, to achieve the desired visual effect. Schematically, we can see how the two draws combine to complete the layer, the opaque triangles in green, and the transparent triangles in orange. We could do a tighter cutout here, minimizing the number of transparent pixels, but there is a trade-off between the reduction in overdraw and the increase in vertex and triangle count. The goal here is to apply the 80-20 rule and save most of the overhead for minimal additional complexity. Now that we have our split layers, we need to render the scene. The best way to render this is to treat it like a 3D scene, assigning each layer to a z-plane in the scene. Like a 3D scene, we can then render the opaque parts from each layer from front to back, using depth testing to populate the depth buffer, and then the transparent parts from back to front, using the depth test to cull parts that are occluded by the opaque layers closer to the camera. This approach gives the guaranteed best behavior in terms of culling and minimizing overdraw, but does require some engine support to handle the pseudo 3D behavior needed. The alternative, which should work just as well most of the time, is to rely on hidden surface removal to cull the overdraw. In this scenario, the renderer renders opaques and transparents from back to front, layer by layer. This can't benefit from early ZS, but hidden surface removal should be able to remove most of the overdraw. This game doesn't have quite the same level of guaranteed performance as using the early ZS test, but it's easier to retrofit into existing 2D renderers. If we put this all together, we go from this starting situation to this. We can see that using the opaque parts of each layer as an occluder successfully removes the vast majority of the overdraw on the scene giving an average overdraw of the frame of just 1.25 fragments per pixel, compared to over 3.5 in the original implementation. In the next video, we will introduce some best practices for shader programs to help you get the best performance on Mali GPUs.